Hey everyone, this is John Buck, back again with the next video in the Array Signal Processing Series. This is video two in our discussion of array gain, uh, looking at comparing conventional beamformers with uh, minimum variance distortionless response, or CAPON beamformers. Uh, and we saw in the last, this is video two, if you haven't seen video one already, stop this one, go back and watch that one. And you'll see what we found is that the array gain in general takes this form, uh, where we say that the array gain is one over this quadratic form with the array weights, and then also uh, with the normalized version of the spatial covariance when the signal is absent. Right, so we say if S of n is the spatial covariance matrix when the signal is absent, we're going to divide out the average per sensor power in that case, where the sigma naught squared is, is equal to, we defined in the last video, would be 1 over n uh, times the trace of Sn. Right, so we take the sum down the diagonal and divide by n to get the average power at each sensor. So if we want to do that, we can now plug into this for a CBF, and we'll see that, remember, our conventional beamformer, our weights, are just the manifold vector for the look direction divided by the number of sensors. So if I do that, the array gain for the CBF will be 1 over v naught Hermitian over n, times Sn bar times v naught her, v naught over n. And so when I have this, I could multiply numerator and denominator by n squared, cancel all these n's out, and what I end up with is that the array gain for this plane wave case, where, where these are the, the vectors, vectors v naught, would be right the manifold vector v naught Hermitian times Sn bar times V0. Now, if these V0s are not plane waves, this would actually be divided by uh, the magnitude of V0 squared, and that's what would, uh, well, I'd have the magnitude of V0 to the fourth up here in the numerator for the array gain. But this is this is our array gain uh, for the conventional beamforming case. And then it's, it's worth taking this a little further to see what happens uh, for the simple example we had earlier. So for our example, Right, we have that Sn is equal to sigma 1 squared times V1, V1 Hermitian plus uh, sigma n squared times I. Right, so if we want to develop this further, we'd say, well, I need to divide by sigma naught squared, which in, in this example, right, sigma naught squared for the one interfere example, we can right, is clearly sigma 1 squared plus sigma n squared. That's the average on the diagonal. And so if we say sigma n bar is, is 1 over sigma naught squared times S of n is how we defined it, we'd be left with sigma 1 squared over sigma naught squared, v1, v1 Hermitian, plus sigma n squared over sigma naught squared times i. So we can then write this in a, uh, we say, well, this is uh, sigma 1 squared over sigma 1 squared plus sigma n squared times v1, v1 Hermitian plus sigma n squared over sigma 1 squared plus sigma n squared times i. Right? And now this, I can divide the sigma n squared out of numerator and denominator of each of these. And I could say this will be equal to, when I multiply numerator and denominator by 1 over sigma n squared, I'll get the interfere to noise ratio at the input over the INR plus 1 times V1, V1 Hermitian. Plus, this, in this case, I'll have a 1 in the numerator when I divide numerator and denominator by sigma n squared, but I'll still have INR plus 1 in the denominator times i. So this is kind of helpful in that we can look at these two things and realize, oh, if I call this thing here, uh, we'll call this beta input, right, this is the ion, at, for a single sensor input, this is the ratio of the interfere power uh, plus one, INR to INR plus one, this is essentially the Wiener gain for a single sensor, and this is would be one minus it then, right, this, if that's, that's beta, we can show with a little algebra, 
this is 1 minus beta n. So it's very helpful that I can say that the normalized version of the spatial covariance matrix, we'll see, we can write this as beta n times v1, v1 Hermitian plus 1 minus beta n times i. So that's sort of pleasing in that we've got, we can think about beta as this knob that can go, right, this beta like we saw in class last week that with the output beta we saw in class, uh, where each of these were multiplied by a capital N. Uh, but, but this can go between 0 and 1, right? So as we turn the dial between 0 and 1, it's telling us how important is the interferer and the background white noise in this normalized matrix. So it's sort of trading off between those. So again, reassuring conceptually, because that's a theme we've seen over and over this semester, of how are we managing our ability to spatially filter out interferers, and how are we managing our ability to attenuate background noise. This beta input is basically saying, well, the, the normalized spatial covariance comes down to a trade-off between those two. So that's a really convenient way to write it. And the other thing we could look one step further is we say, you know, this is halfway to a projection matrix, right? I could write this as, as beta n times n times v1, v1 Hermitian over n plus 1 minus beta n times i. And when I do it that way, this term here now is v1 over v1 Hermitian. This is the projection matrix for v1. And so with a little bit of massaging to set me up for, for some things later here, a little bit of algebraic uh, manipulation, we've shown that, that the normalized spatial covariance can be written as this blend be, you know, that goes from 0 to 1 of n times that beta times v, p of v1 plus 1 minus that beta times the white noise term. Okay, so now our next step, maybe I'll, I'll start that on, the, on a new page, uh, is to take this expression here and use it to find the denominator back up here. So we're going to use this with v naught. So let, let's let's start that on a new page. So we have that. Oh, don't want to get to that. Uh, so we have to to continue the story. We're trying to solve for the denominator in that array gain, which was v naught s sub n bar, or v naught Hermitian s sub n bar v naught. Right, and we're, we're using, we can say, well, we've got v naught Hermitian. Now let's plug in what we had here just a second ago. So I have the input beta times n times the projection matrix for v1 plus 1 minus beta n times i times v naught. And since we're on a new page, let's just remind ourselves that beta n is the Wiener gain for i and r times i and r plus 1. Right, so this is, again is the denominator we're trying to solve for. Let's do the second term first is easier, right, because v naught Hermitian times i times v naught will just give us a v naught magnitude squared. So over here I'll have 1 minus beta n times magnitude of the, man, of the look direction manifold vector magnitude v naught squared. Here I'll have beta n times i and n times P of V1 times V0 on either side leaves me with this will be V0 Hermitian V1. If I plug in for P of V1, I have this squared over N. We say, well, that's getting close to a cosine squared. And those usually make, look, looking for chances to make those, make it easier to understand what's going on conceptually. So if I wanted to do that, I could do this, in fact, to, to be, I need inner product squared over magnitude of each one squared. Well, so well, each v naught and v1 down here in the denominator. Let me sort of remind ourselves what we're aiming to. We say, well, I could say the cosine, generalized cosine squared, is the inner product of the two vector, vectors over each of their magnitudes squared. So I do that. Each of these needs to be an n, but I've only got one. But that's easily fixed like that. So I can now say that that term we're trying to get to, v naught Hermitian s bar v naught, will be 
the input beta times n squared times cosine squared, right, the generalized cosine between the, the manifold vector of the look direction and the interferer direction, plus this term here becomes another n. Right, so this becomes n times 1 minus beta n. So I'm going to pull an n out in front of all of this, just one n from this one. And so I'm still left with n, oh, I'm left with, I can't forget the beta n. I have beta n times another n times cos squared v naught v1 plus 1 minus beta n. Right, so now let me put that back into our array gain expression. Right, if we go back to the previous page and look up, we have the n squared over this thing we've just found. So now we're going back to plug in for this term here to get the CBF array gain. On, we'll put this on a new page too. So combining the things we've seen, we have the CBF array gain is going to be n squared over the thing we just found, which was n times beta n times n times cos squared between v naught and v1 plus uh, 1 minus beta n. Well, so obviously we can cancel one of these ends, and this starts to make sense a little bit, and then we say, well, you know, we, we remember when things are white noise, just white noise, we have an array gain of, of n, right? We, we saw that with the, the white noise gain is, is n for the conventional beam former. And that would be, if, if we have just white noise, this beta would be zero, so this term would go away, and I'd have just a one here. So yes, this thing goes back to be n when I have no interferer present and beta is zero. When the interferer, or when the inf interferer gets very weak, that makes good sense. But we can simplify this even a little further to say I've got n. And I'm going to re-put beta n back in here. So I'll say this is inr over inr plus 1 times n times cos squared of v naught v1. And then 1 minus beta 1 is 1 over the same inr plus 1. And so now to simplify this just a little further, I'm going to multiply numerator and denominator by inr plus 1. Right, so that will clean these things up some. And so I end up with a numerator that's n times inr plus 1 over inr times n times cos squared plus this just leaves 1. So it says basically, depending as, as the inter if I have one interferer present, and again, this is just, just to remind us, this is not true for every situation. This is for the single interferer plane wave. Right, so this is helpful in that we can take that general expression we had a few pages earlier and say, well, this is how it behaves, or this is how we can break it down some when we have just a single plane wave interferer. And what we find is it depends on how many sensors we have, how loud the interferer is compared to the background white noise, which is the INR here. Right, that again, just to remind ourselves, INR is equal to sigma 1 squared over sigma n squared. Right, so the interferer power over the background white noise power. And it also depends on how far is the interferer away from v naught. This is essentially the beam pattern of the CBF. Remember the, the cos squared, we can also think of this as a CBF beam pattern. So this is saying if I take what I'm looking in the u0 direction, so if I tune it for the u0 direction, then I go look in the u1 direction, what's the side lobes in the power pattern, the magnitude squared. So the, the further away the interferer is already, the smaller this term gets, right? If the interferer was already in a null, well, then that's great, because I'm going to get a whole lot better here. But then uh, I should be careful about that, because I think if, if it's already in a null, we might have divided by zero. So. Um, but as this term gets very small, 
right, is cosine squared. So, so as V naught and V one become more and more orthogonal, this term goes away, and I have more and more array gain. But if this uh, is is on a side lobe, but it turns out maybe not so great. It turns out my my INR is is limited by this. And in fact, we can also think of that as n times INR gets very large. This first term dominates the numerator, and this first term dominates the denominator. So, sort of thinking about asymptotes briefly to finish this off, right? As INR is well, it sort of depends on n times INR. As this goes to zero, I get a one up here. So as the interfere gets very weak, I get a, a uh, uh, maybe that's not the best way to do it. So we can say as i and r goes to zero, then I get an n in the numerator, and in the denominator I get a one, right? As i and r goes to zero, this term becomes zero, I'm left with a one. So as the interfere gets very weak, it's like I just have white noise again, and I'm back to the white noise gain of a CBF, which is good. As I and R goes to infinity, right, this term dominates. I have N times I and R. Divided by, and the denominator, this term dominates that one. And so I have N times I and R times cos squared. And so this thing approaches 1 over cos squared. So it's interesting that as interferes get very loud, my white noise gain is, is basically limited by where is the interfere relative to the, the CBF beam pattern. Not how loud is it at all. At some point, it doesn't matter how loud it is or how many sensors you have. This is what's limiting your array gain. So that's plenty in this one. I'm going to stop this. And in the last video, we'll go on and talk about how does this look different for MBDR.